the Bear was actually a restaurant, it would be a wine bar. It would have a slightly more minimal menu. It would be very concerned about, like, getting the right kind of wine list. I mean, they'd be aware that that's where they're going to make all their money. And, like, there would be a mesh between the two things. So, This is Taste. I'm your host, Matt Rodbard. John Fine is here. He's a longtime journalist, cultural critic, touring musician, and now the editor-in-chief of The New Wine Review, an exciting publication that digs into the world of low-intervention wine. In this conversation, we talk about what is exciting John in wine today and how The New Wine Review is changing the way wine is written about. The voice, the language, the attitude, it's all really fresh. I really hope you enjoy this conversation with John Fine. John Fine, welcome to This Is Taste. It's really nice to meet you, man. It's great to meet you too, Matt. Thanks so much for having me. Well, you know what? I'm a big fan of the new wine review. You know, what you're doing, I think, aligns a little bit about what we do at Taste. We try to bring in stories that have meat to them. Like, we we, we report on culture um, about something that has, like, very basic things. Like, we write about food, and food can be very basic. But there's also a lot of nuance. There's a lot of reporting. And you're doing the same. I've really enjoyed reading it. You gave me a free subscription, so thank you. You can subscribe, listener... By, by by going to the website, I just said enough. Mm-hmm. John, tell me a little bit about the new wine review. So um, the theory with the new wine review is this: um, as with food media, um, the conversation about wine has changed a lot in the past, let's say, twenty twenty five years. To us, this conversation started in the uh, pioneering natural wine bars of Paris, like Racines. Um, it spread pretty quickly. Outside of Paris, New York. I'm sorry, London first, uh, Copenhagen, Tokyo, New York, and then to wine shops that are smart pretty much everywhere. And, you know, you can think that the wine bar, the kind of, you know, wine bar that is very into low intervention producers like we are and care deeply about how the wine is made and, you know, care deeply about the next interesting thing and, you know, the people in the region that are doing it interestingly. You may think that that wine bar is only in New York, LA, London. No. Um, We wrote about a fabulous wine bar in Maple Shade, New Jersey, which is uh, nine miles from Philadelphia. Uh, it is called Versi Vino. It has got an amazing wine list. It is right by a place where you donate plasma in a strip mall. Wow. There is a great wine bar in Sarasota, Florida. I mean, no, no just on Sarasota, Florida, but I mean, it's not New York City or London. There is a, there is a natural wine bar in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, there are two in Burlington, Vermont. I could go on. So this kind of gathering place is everywhere. Um, smart wine shops are everywhere. And there's a conversation that's gone on about wine in those places. We don't think that's been re- reflected in the what I'll define as the legacy wine media. This <laughs> right. is wine spectator, wine enthusiast, um, Guyoni, wine advocate, you know, blah, 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 all the big names, James Suckling. Um, and we just think that there's a giant audience of people that aren't getting what they want out of um, out of wine media. I mean, I'm not. And uh, like we, we just think that there's a just a vast terrain to play with, and we think that it's really interesting, and we like the topic. Uh, it's it's really a rich text to to cover. I you say something that I, I want to ask you about. You say smart wine shop. What it, what makes a smart wine shop? What makes a smart wine bar? I feel like this is the monoculture of drinking now. Like every wine bar has a great list. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I mean, I think if you go to certain places, um, you know, your Peter Luger's a great restaurant. They do not have a great wine list. By the way, they now have a good corkage policy, so bring your wine to Peter Luger. It's worth it. Um, There are lots of great restaurants that don't have great wine lists. Um, Both of us live in New York City, and we're somewhat spoiled for choice. Um, What is a smart wine shop? A smart wine shop is run by someone who is up on what's happening in wine, who is not wedded to the idea that, like, important and prestige wine is only Bordeaux or Napa or a couple of regions in Italy. Uh, no diss on those regions. They're great. There's just many others in that. Um, a, a good wine shop, a really good wine shop is run by someone who understands natural wine, but probably is not absolutely dogmatic about it, that understands that like very well-made wine can be made in, in, in a number of different ways by producers who you know care about the grapes, care about the vines, care about the land. And there is also, this is the je ne sais quoi, like a point of view. You know, like, and when you go there, you feel like you're learning something. When they send you an email newsletter, and I get a lot of these, like, you want to open it because, number one, there's going to be wine that you got to jump on. 
or it's going to be sold. And number two, you're probably going to learn something about this producer in Georgia that they're bringing in. Or like, hey, there's an amazing producer in Portugal named Luis Sibra, who's amazing. Like, I mean, I learned about Luis Sibra from the Flatiron Wines newsletter, you know, um, like they're doing a great job of teaching you. And that's what makes a smart place. Like so, it, ma- well- it makes you smarter about wine. And it keeps you curious. Such an interesting point that media plays a role in wine shops and even wine bars that articulating their point of view, be it with with a written newsletter or on the menu, how it's articulated, how it's laid out, is a big part of what makes a wine shop smart. I think I'll add a layer. I'd love to get your take. What about aesthetics? I feel like aesthetics of these spaces matters as well as we're judging our bottle shops and we're walking down the street or we're heading to you know Sarasota, Florida, and we're there for work and we're trying to find a cool place to have a glass of wine. Aesthetics matter. John, right now, 2024, is there a wine bar aesthetic that you, I would say, are drawn towards that you feel like it's working? Well, I think, um, you know, there's two kinds that come to mind for me. One is like, I'll call them, it's kind of like the children of Le Verville in Paris, where it's like- Love that place. It's tiny. It's kind of dark. Um, the, the There's like a couple of sort of askew posters about natural wine. Um, there's a ton of bottles. Um, there's not much in the way of decorative elements. And then there's the sort of like Scandinavian, Tokyo kind of vibe. Um, Four Horsemen, of which, full disclosure, you know, my my wife and I are minority investors in, minority minority, but investors nonetheless. Um, you've got a lot of um, a light colored wood. Um, you've got sort of uh, a vibe that, for lack of a better term, we'll call Scandinavian. Um, like it, it, it's a lot of wood tones. And and it's 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 vibey in that way. And you know, I think you look back at Momofuku Sambar. I think yeah. like probably yeah. crystallized that aesthetic even before some of the other places. Yeah, that's a good into. call. I mean, like ideally, these wine bars have more comfortable seats than the Momofuku. It's do, very but, true. Good point. But I mean, like it was part of the business model in Momofuku, where like you don't want to stay there for more than an hour and a half. It was a very good move. I was burying the lead too when I when you disclosed as a good journalist does uh, about your 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 investment and in, in interest in, in the Four Horsemen. Um, what a what a remarkable place. And let's just go there. And the book's coming out this fall. And, and we're going to have Nick Cartola on, maybe James. And I heard James lives in Taiwan now. So we've had them both on the show. Either of them will be on. That'll be a great conversation. But tell me, what does the Four Horsemen mean for this world that you're covering so rigorously on your in your publication? Well, um, I, I got to start by saying I'm really biased because, I mean, it's my my close friends run it. Um, uh, I love the place. I'm not really I, I don't have a very good distance on it. Um, there is an, there is an amazing point of view to that wine list. Um, you know, Justin Cherno, uh, one of my closest friends for I don't want to say how long um, he's built an amazing wine list. I mean, and he's he's incredibly up on the new producers and the new new producers. I learned something every time I talk to him. And the list is extremely well chosen. And um, one of the things that I really love about it is that they are welcoming in a way that, you know, wine can intimidate people. And natural wine can be very off-putting. There's kind of a chip on its shoulder. uh, Or, I mean, some people perceive there to be a chip on its shoulder. Um, And the way that they kind of take people through the wine list if they're not familiar, or even if, like, they are, like, I'll come in and I'll be like... I'm thinking about this, this, and this, and they'll kind of nod their heads and say, like, all right, we're going to bring up three wines. And I'm like, great. Um, And, like, I just – it's just lovely. And so on one hand, you have a point of view, which is great. But on the other hand, it is welcoming. Like, they're not dicks. And, um, you know, one of the sort of metaphors I keep making because I'm a music guy is, you know, the record shop. The record store where like you had to go gather around grandpa's, you know, rocking chair, children, um, (laughs) you know, in the pre-internet days, you had to go there to learn about music. And like you had to put up with like the grumpy dudes and they were all dudes behind the counter who were like old and kind of weird. And um, uh, I I did a book about music called Your Band Sucks about my bands and this whole milieu. And um, Clay Tarver, who went on to he was in bands like Chavez and Bolt LaVolta, went on to be a, an executive producer at Silicon Valley. He's now a big screenwriter. He had this great line where it's like, yeah, like learning about music he cared about. It was like you had to go like find the weird old guy in town and like hang out in an uncomfortable thing. It was kind of like trying to find a Coke dealer or something. And <laughs> like a little bit of a dovetail with a Coke dealing in indie record stores. Still a little bit. We'll just say. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and all the ones that I know went out of business, so they weren't doing that. And 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 you know that that that's funny and haha. But like you know you had to deal with people who were kind of judgmental and grumpy and cross and yeah. like that's that's not a great vibe. 
you know, and, um, you know, the New Wine Review has a point of view. Like, you know, the New Wine Review is like inherently on the side of like low interventionist producers. Um, uh, we are quizzical, to say the least, about um, things like, you know, Bordeaux Empremers. You know, the pricing is finally going down on that. Um, there are certain wines we like better than others, but I mean, you know, we're going to strive not to be dicks about it. And I like, hope you've Like a great wine shop, you have a point of view in your publication. I will dig more into the publication, but I want to zoom out about your career. It's interesting. You mentioned your your, your musical career, uh, Bitch Magnet, some other bands. You've been in the scene. You also, your second act was you're a media reporter. You covered journalism. You were writing about media in a go-go era that had a lot of great narrative. And now in your third era, uh, oh my God, I can't believe I just said era. You are writing about wine. John, like, when did wine enter your life? And when did you actually start to think about wine critically? The, so my dad liked wine. Um, and I didn't get it. Uh, I was, and like, I mean, he liked it. He was not obsessed. There were a couple of producers he liked. And he had, he had something of an interest in it. It would be open in the house every now and again. And um, I didn't care. I was in punk rock bands. Um, I was in my early 20s. I was drinking primarily for volume and goal-oriented reasons. Like, and, <laughs> and like wine was inefficient and expensive. Natural like, Boone's, Boone's Farm wine. Didn't um, come... Mad Dog was a thing yeah. in college. Um, I knew how to drink it. I was around people that didn't understand that even though it tastes like grape juice, it's actually 19% alcohol. And like that led to some messy situations. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But again, like you're, you're, we're drinking for a goal. Um my, my dad, I was in my late 20s. My dad poured me a glass of like Stag's Leap, uh, Warren Winiarski's Stag's Leap from the probably the late 80s with some age on. And I tasted it and I was like, I get it. There was kind of a organizational principle in the brain of music nerds where it's like um, these kinds of bands came out of this area because and, and like you can sort of sense their influence in the places they tour to. And that is a very easy thing to transpose to. Um, Okay, so this winemaker's in Burgundy, but he studied with Marcel Lapierre. That winemaker got interested in carbonic approaches. He got that winemaker got interested in natural approaches, and you can sense that influence. And it, it's a very easy thing to do. So th it started, you know, with some of my music friends, among them Justin at Four Horsemen. Um, like it was just an easy thing to do. We started going to this place on the Upper West Side called Nancy's Wines, mm -hmm. um, which was the buyer there was a guy named Willie Gluckstern who did a great book called The Wine Avenger, which in the 90s came out pretty hard. I was like, all right, Chardonnay sucks. Merlot sucks. Like, Napa Cabernet is undrinkable. You should be drinking Riesling. You know it's a great grape? Chenin Blanc. You know it's another great grape? Cabernet Franc. People say it's green. They're wrong. It's awesome. And it just had a sort of Punk rock ethic. Sure. Let's get real. I was going to say, say oppositional. And, and oppositional. That, that was appealing. Like yeah. when the first wine, wave of natural wine started coming to America, it was that too. And, um, you know, we were attracted. I was attracted early on to the, to the extremity of it. Frank Cornelison now makes very precise wines. He's also not a natural winemaker anymore, really. Um, he was making like stuff, 70% alcohol. There were chunks of stuff floating in it. And I was like, great. Mm. Give me that. Yeah. I want that. My dad's not going to drink that. And, you know, you can evolve from that. I, I did to a certain degree. Um, but it, it all started happening in my late 20s and early 30s. And it I discovered when I started going to Nancy's Wines for Food in the, this is the late 90s, I guess. You can get a great bottle of Riesling then and kind of now for 15 bucks. Austrian, German yeah. we're talking about? We're not yeah, talking yeah. about Austrian, no, German Riesling. German yeah, like Riesling. They, they had a great German section. Yeah. You know, I was getting really interesting Cabernet Franc. I wish I could remember what they were. 13 bucks a bottle. Yeah. And like, that was cool. It was really interesting. And, and, it, and it was sort of like shopping for records. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you've really articulated it well why there's so many comparisons on different levels of sophistication about punk rock music and natural wine. And I think you've laid out this case about why you've, you're, you're, you're interested in it and why you started drinking it. Um, once you're at Nancy's and you're, and you're drinking these wines in the 90s, tell me about New York. How does New York pivot and become a city that I feel is probably one of the hotbeds for wine bars? Are there other people that you went to, to, to visited their establishments or you learned from in that early 2000s? Because I want to get a sense for a listener about this era of New York because I think it's interesting. So, I mean, a lot of the early pioneers, which are somewhat forgotten now, like there was a restaurant called 360 in Red Hook that had a tasting menu for, I think, $30. Insane. And, so and a great true. wine list. Yeah. And but here's the thing. I didn't go there because I was broke. Yeah. Like, I mean, it, it was a stretch for me to spend, you know, $40 on three bottles of wine, you know, at, at Nancy's Wines for Food. 
So, I mean, it starts coming in. And like I like to me, as far as I know, and I am not the authority here, like 360 was very important in getting natural wine sort of into the bloodstream a little bit here. But, you know, you also have long running restaurants like Tribeca Grill who have long bought, you know, in a very interesting manner, it's got a very deep Riesling selection. I'm not even a giant Riesling guy at this point, but I mean, like, you know, that was a move in the 90s. Like, yeah, we've got two pages of German Rieslings, mm-hmm. you know. Well, but or crew. More. Yeah. Does crew play a role? Oh, in man, crew. Yeah, crew was my birth, my big birthday splurge dinner yeah. for, for a couple of years. How long was that around? It wasn't around that long. It wasn't along that, around that long, but they, they of course, had um, a 10,000 bottle list. They did, yeah. So and, that's crew, CRU, yeah. um, on Lower Fifth Avenue. Um, also Veritas yeah, of course. in the East 20s. Um, I'm forgetting the guy whose cellar that was, giant cellar. He, he was a big Chateauneuf guy, which is which is not my thing. Yeah. But, um, and, and, you know, you also have the the war horses that are just, that that have long been good about wine. I mean, Danielle, um, Harry's of Hanover Square, way downtown, um, Steakhouse, that they don't put their wine list online so people don't know how good it is, but it's a very serious, very good list. They've been buying it for a long time. Um, Eli's Table on the Upper East Side. Yeah, we've had him on the podcast. He's been buying wine since forever. That's Eli Zabar, if anyone doesn't yeah, know. Exactly, it hasn't yeah. been there. Um, and, and, it's, and, it's, it's a fantastic list. They've got a great sommelier Thibault there now. It's great. Um, and th- that's been around for a while. So I think you have a mix of like the newcomers and like, but it's interesting. We mentioned two restaurants that came in really hard that were wine focused, Crew and Veritas, and they both didn't last. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. What about Terroir, Paul Greco? That's, you know, that that's really important. I, I feel like I'd like to get and your also take. also in terms of accessibility. Yeah. Um, I, you know, you, you would go to Hearth. I wish I had the time frame right, but this is in the first decade of the century. And, and um, you his wine lists were like fanzines, you know, and they were exuberant. They were all over the place. Um, he had a lot of selections that, to put it gently, were very off the beaten path. Um, I may not have agreed with everything there, but they were really interesting. And like, they were worth reading on their own. It's really cool to talk about Paul because he, to me, was one of the early guys who was who thought about aesthetics of his menu design, handwritten menus. You know, By the way, speaking about like kind of a, a divey, you know, natural wine bar, I mean, totally. Yeah. There were, and he had a couple locations, Tribeca, you know, Bunch, Murray yeah. Hill, had the, but the one in the East Village, I think everyone knows. And like, honestly, he's, you know, championing Portugal, you know, in the early 2000s. He's championing, obviously, wines from Germany. He was on the payroll, I'm sure, but he, he was definitely- I, I don't think so. I think he just cared. He just loved deep. those wines. And like, you know, Paul was somebody- um, who doesn't get talked about enough, I feel. You're, you're absolutely right. And I I didn't mention him. Is he doing something now? I don't know Paul, uh, what Paul's up to. I haven't connected with him in a decade. But. Yeah. I mean, I had dinner at Hearth. He's not involved anymore. They still no. have a pretty good wine list. Um, I had dinner at Hearth recently. It was quite good. Yeah. Um, like, still really delivers. Great restaurant. So, it you know, it's, it's people like that. And I'm sure there's a bunch we're forgetting, which, you know, which kind of bums me out. I've got a text thread with some of my closest friends who are all into wine. And we were trying to remember, like, what were the real pioneers here? I mean, Ten Bells came a little later. Yeah. Um, obviously really important, like divey natural wine bar. Um, I had some really long nights there. Yeah. Really, really long nights. Um, that ended in ways that, um, that were, I didn't feel so good the next day. John, let me ask you, this is like a big consideration when we're thinking about wine media. How do you, as a publication, think about grading, ranking, stack ranking, holistically ranking. I don't know. Like, how do you think about grading wines? Like, what's your point of view? Because I think ultimately we want to read about, you know, the, the, the color. We want to read about producers, about culture. We'll get into some of the stories that you've covered. But like, also, like, we want to know what to drink. So how do you bring that in a fresh way? Because I think you have major ambitions to do things differently here. Yeah. So we, we, we've put a lot of thought into that. And, um, you know, you can get across the experience of wine, um, I think, pretty well without a number. You know, some people want numbers, and that's fine. That's totally cool. I mean, like, you know, we're, we're certainly not ruling out doing something in that realm, you know, in the future. We've experimented with that as well. Um, but, again, I'm, I'm speaking personally. And, you know, based on some early indicators from our readers, like, they're more interested in, like, this is the thing. This is what it is. This is kind of the feeling, you know, like, you know, this is what you drink it with. This this is sort of like the approximate flavor profile. And, um, you know, I admire Noble Rod a lot. And, um, you know, I think, you know, Dan has made the point over there that, um, you know, like he's he's trying to get across the idea of the experience and like a more... I don't want to say ethereal, but a more like sensual experience of and like the energy it gives you. And you know, like, like that's cool. I guess we're trying to find a middle road between that 
and, and also, putting numbers on yeah or or just, or just i mean like you know um people are going to i mean eric asimov who i really admire like you know when he does his 20 wines i i read that yeah i read that top to bottom like you know we do versions of that ourselves there are ways you can do that that are like cynical and crappy and not thought out or you can do it in a way that reflects your perspective point of view and sensibility we just did 25 wines for summer um, they ranged in price from eighteen dollars to around one hundred and fifty. There was everything from, uh, you know, uh, pet nats from Cassard, made from Aligote, to stuff from Austria to a nineteen ninety Foreman Cabernet Sauvignon. Because I, I will go to the mat on this, like a classically styled California Cabernet with age, and I mean, like you got to go back thirty years before they got really fat. That. Outside on a patio on a summer evening with like a piece of grilled meat is it is fucking heaven. Wow, you like, can get a ninety for one hundred and fifty. Yes, yeah. interesting. Um, for for I mean, like you, you have to know how to play it. I mean, Foreman tends to be pretty well priced. Yeah. Um, I like I'm consistently finding it in the hundreds, and like that's a splurge, frankly. But I mean, like you know, occasionally in the summertime, fuck yes. Also, I spend too much time thinking about wine. I definitely spend too much money on wine. But like you know. The the bigger point is that for the 25 wines to drink this summer, like we wanted to have a range of options and like a range of price points. And also just like we wanted them to be from all over the place, you know, Australia, Austria, South Africa, America, you know, France, Germany, you know, blah, 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 blah. For our listeners who have gotten this far in the interview, clearly there's- We hope you're still listening. We hope you're still listening. I think there are many who are. And I, I think there's an obvious challenge for all wine drinkers to understand terroir and the, all the countries you just listed. So, John, how do we, as wine drinkers, not me personally, but our listenership, how do we think about terroir and actually remembering and having that list? And, like, there's a lot of memory, which is cool, and I think that's why musicians and computer scientists and folks who are quantitative or into wine, it makes a lot of sense. But how do we, like normal people, think about terroir and, like, reaching for that 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 wine in in South Australia and being like wow I really want to go to that place like I I I think it's a, always going to be the math problem in our heads wow well as with math problems or with certain math problems some are more complicated than others i mean the thing about wine that's makes it endlessly interesting to me is that it's endless i mean you know you can be satisfied and there's nothing wrong with this with being like you know california napa or sonoma or like you know Burgundy, you know, and be fine with that. Or you can get really insane and start thinking about vineyards and you can start thinking about soil types and you can start thinking about, um, I was just in the Northern Rhone. It matters a huge deal if you care enough about it. And I do like, are the vines in the Northern Rhone on the slopes or are they in the valley? Because if they're in the valley, it's going to be hot and it's going to be, the, the Syrah is going to have a much different character. But if it's on the slopes, it's going to be cool and it's much different and better. So like the question is, how deep do you want to go? Um, and like, I may care about if there's iron in the soil or granite in the soil or limestone in the soil. I don't know if I really recommend this for normal people because you will lose your mind. <laughs> like, I mean, it, it becomes very all-encompassing. But I mean, in general, um, if you are looking for uh, fresher styled wines, you know, to use the current parlance, that goes well with a range of cuisine. And if you don't want, you know, um, Bordeaux uh, that's from, that's, you know, very pricey and 14.5% alcohol or like, you know, a, a Napa Cabernet that's got a lot of oak on it. That's 14 and a half or 15% alcohol. Um, you know, you're looking for cooler climates. Um, elevation is really good. Um, coastal regions tends to be really good. And you're looking for a winemaker, generally speaking, that is not making a huge amount of wine, like somewhere th there's usually a fair amount of, um, guesswork in exactly how many cases they make. But, you know, people that are, people can be really hands-on with somewhere under 5,000 cases a year. And also, like, look at the website. Um, look at what people say about that winemaker, um, you know, and see if they seem thoughtful. I love that you lay out some real indicators of quality and you set parameters when you're looking outside of those 14.5s. I think that's important. I think you've done something that's really, really important and magical here on this on this episode. You've you've articulated um, what we want. We want drinkable wines that are refreshing. Is that the word? The parlance is refreshable, or they, they, they say fresh. I mean, fresh, like, it, yeah. fresh. You know, mineral, acidic. You know, like those kind of words. But like something that's like you want something that you can hang with over the course hang of hang with, and like that's like most wine drinkers. I know that some of our listeners are probably 
like collectors and that's great but like most of the folks who who love wine are want to drink it right away it's kind of the way we consume wine so i think that's really cool you mentioned about going to the northern rhone do you get out and about a bit john are you are you are you hitting hitting these press trips are you just like going out and renting that uh the peugeot and just driving around oh uh, well we, we we at the new wine review we don't do junkets we, we we don't take um like giant freebie trips like that um I like I went with a good friend of mine who's a wine consultant in Copenhagen and we drove around the Northern Rhone for three days. Um, I spent a couple of days by myself in Oregon and I'm forgetting what month it is sometime in the late spring. Um, uh, I am going to get to Europe again, I hope, in the fall. Um, I candidly, I don't get out as much as I'd like to. And or I mean, like there is a publication to build and there's a lot of work with that. And it's it's joyful. But I mean, it means that. Um, there's an old uh, conception of the editor in chief as being someone who's kind of swanning around town. Um, there's just not a lot of time for that. Agree. Like, as, like as, well, you know, when I was in Oregon, um, and by the way, like I've got an amazing job. This is not in any way a complaint, but it's like in Oregon, I was waking up at five thirty six in the morning, spending a couple of hours working, getting in the car, driving around. You know, bang, 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 bang. Four appointments. You know, f- f- fairly significant distances between both. Eating a quick dinner, coming back, doing a few more hours of work, going to bed at eleven. Like that's fine. E I C D E I C. This is straight talk. Exactly. No complaints. I love my job. No, dream no job, complaints. But, but no it's complaints. it's definitely when you're when you're doing that kind of work on the road, it's it can be tricky. I want to get into the publication because really the heart of it uh, is not the ratings of wine. It is the color of wine. It is the it is the the characters around wine and. And really, one story uh, that c- comes to mind right away, I was just reviewing your, your site yesterday, is The Bear, The Bear is Big News. And Jason Wilson wrote a great piece about the absence of wine on this this very popular television show. I love that piece. It's smart. Tell me about what's your take on, on The Bear's absence of wine? So there's, there's a couple ways I can parse this. One is like, what would be most realistic for a restaurant? And one is like, the actual, like, how you have to make a TV show. Um and <laughs> there obviously there's a pretty big gap in the show in terms of the reality of a restaurant. Like a restaurant like that has to make its money on drinks. Well, it has to. Um, and like it's funny. Like I knew all along. Like they're not really talking about wine, which is weird. But okay, it's it's. I don't need this to be a documentary. But Jason pointed out like there are drinks, but there's no bar. And I'm like, oh, that's something they really should have thought about. Like, I, and I. I understand why the writers probably want to set this in the kitchen. Um, there's more action in a kitchen. Like, Assam is, like, running to a basement, rummaging through bottles, um, pulling them out and popping them. Um, there's not a lot of action there. But, I mean, yeah, it's a major hole in the show. It, it's it's kind of weird. And, obviously, like, people have been talking about it. And, like, Jason pulled that piece together very quickly. I was thrilled with it. Um, and, you know, to me, um, it's... You know, the the main point of it was that, like, the really funny thing about there not being wine on The Bear as a show is that if The Bear was actually a restaurant, it would be a wine bar. Like, it would be – it would have a slightly more minimal menu. Um, It would be, like, very obsessed with, like – you know, I mean, The Bear kind of looks like a wine bar, like the way we've been talking about. Like, it would be very concerned about, like, getting the right kind of wine list. I mean, they'd be aware that that's where they're going to make all their money. And, like, there would be a mesh between the two things. Um, it's a missed opportunity for sure. And I think, you know, in season three, episode three, we see sweeps like breaking the court commit service. That seems implausible. I love sweeps, but it seems like that would not be part of it. It's, this is the drama of television. But let me ask you, have you seen- By the way, I break quirks all the fucking time. Okay, yeah. Let me, all the time. Okay, bro. Let me let, let me get into that because I do too. And like, how do you, like, that's always such a stress. I'm the non-drinker. I'm usually the one opening the water, wine and it's stressful. It, 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 yeah, I mean, it's particularly like, I mean, I have a lot of wine. I've got old wine. Um, I've bought old wine and, um, oh God, I, I wish I could tell you I have a way. What, what I will say is this, I've gotten very good at once the cork breaks, I've gotten really good at taking like a butter knife and like easing it out with the butter knife so that the cork doesn't disintegrate into the wine. Like that, that that's what I got. I am not good at it. I got to get better. Have you seen Drops of God? I have not. I know I need to. I mean, should I? No, I don't. I don't like it personally. No, I'm <laughs> why not? I, I don't like the show. I think it's right. really like poor. I think there's like some bad acting in it. I think the premise is incredible, and I know there's like some TV podcasters who love the show and think it's like the best in the world. I, I don't like the show, but I like the premise a lot, and I like the idea of succession and the idea of like wine in Japan and in mm-hmm. France and how those two countries dovetail. Is there? 
we're on the topic of media. Is there any portrayal of wine in media, either documentary or or scripted, that you think is good? Well, let's see. Uh, there, there are great books. Um, okay, but, you're, but you you're more of a that. book guy. No, 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 no. But I will say this: um, the first Psalm documentary. Yeah. Um, so good. Not only did I cry when I watched it, I cried more than once. Um, I, I thought it was. I got very into the the um, the uh, arc of all the characters. Um, I felt that one pretty deeply. Um, I, I thought it was extraordinarily well done. Um, Mondo Vino, like they obviously set up some straw men in there, yeah, you know, which I may or may not agree with. Um, it, 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 it was it was more important in its time because I think it's like 2009 or 2010 when, like, you had to make a point about it's low interventionist versus like quote unquote big corporate wine, like whatever. Um, and going after Robert Parker, like okay, fine, whatever. Um, but in terms of movies. Um, People would tell me, like, you know, you're in a band. You need to see Almost Famous. And I'd watch <laughs> it and I'd be like, yeah, OK, this is preposterous. Like, th- th- this is like, like, this is not how, like, you know, journalism works. This is not how, like, um, yeah. uh, like bands work. This is not how bands interact with writers. Like, the guy in the band does not tell the guy, just tell the truth or whatever the fuck it was. Yeah, yeah, it was so um, people have told me I need to see Drops of God. And I'm like, OK, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I like, just... like uh, I saw Sideways, whatever. It's it's a. Uh, the thing about Sideways that nobody gets is that um, Miles is a very bad person. Like, that's not talked about enough. He stole from his mom. Like, yeah. like he's, and it's interesting that he's an unsympathetic it's a, character. It has not aged well. No. That no. is a pun. I mean, it feels like it has problems and it's not really brought up as a great film. No, I don't think it is. Um, uh, also, they were drinking Sea Smoke, which I, I guess in the time they would have been drinking that. Uh, shots fired. I, I fucking love this shot. <laughs> what? <laughs> I did shots fired. I like, I like the, like, yeah. Sea Smoke is, I don't know, man. Like, I, I drank it for a little while when I was yeah. getting away, but it's like, it's a very big syrupy wine. I just, I just don't care for wines like that. I just, I just don't. I'm going to ask you about non-alcoholic wines, NA wines. I feel this is close to me. I'm I'm an NA guy. We talk about NA a lot on the show. I've not had a good one. So um, I think there's a broader way to look at like NA as a category. Um, I've not had a good NA wine. So one pillar of what New Wine Review does is that we have a subscriber-only Slack, um, mm. uh, which, you know, where we're, we're nerding out on stuff and trading stuff. It's really fun. But I bring it up because um, someone posted a Slack that basically said, like, all right, any beer, like The Athletic, is really good. Like, it's basically beer. Why should I drink beer anymore? And the consensus, I mean, it, it was a huge thread and, like, a lot of smart people. The consensus was that there is no good any wine. Um, that N.A. liquor that tries to be whiskey is gross, but N.A. liquor, well, quote unquote liquors that are based on botanicals can be really good, especially in the context of a cocktail. And that N.A. beer, which I've avoided, has taken a quantum leap in the past couple of years. And people were throwing around a couple of um, uh, names. One of them was Athletic, I believe. The other I'm forgetting. I should have I should know it. But um and th- they were just like, th- these are people that know drinking and they're like, I don't really drink beer anymore. Like, this is fine. And as someone who I enjoy wine a lot, I also don't have an enormous tolerance for alcohol. I mean, I'm 5'9", I weigh like 145 pounds. Um, like, I would drink more wine if it had half the alcohol. Now, I understand that there's a vinification process and it's going to hit a certain number. But like, um, if I can drink three ice cold beers by the pool now that have no alcohol, I mean... That sounds great. Okay, so a couple points here. First, I'm going to link to the show notes. Jordan Michael Min just wrote a great piece about any beers. And Correct. And there are a lot of really good ones, and I think it's, you know, a couple names come to mind. Um, United Artists Italian Style Pills, the Zero Dry Asahi. I love those beers. I think Athletic is good, too. Uh, any day as well. But back to wine, it seems like if you dealkalize wine, so you get all that age, you get all the like the process and and the terroir, then you remove the alcohol. Something happens to that wine that doesn't happen with beer. Like you don't have the body, you know. That's and, or you, and you don't have something. And I think that's a I, th- I think that's super astute because I mean, like you know, alcohol is sugar initially, and if you don't take it out, you have grape juice. And if you have it, it's alcoholic. But if you take it out, it it like th- there are important things that the alcohol does to the mouthfeel, to like to the body. Um, probably, I'm not in any way an expert on this, but probably in a way that like certain flavor compounds are activated, and you can't just sort of like pull out that thing and not have the house of cards sort of fall in on itself a little bit. Having said that, um, if 
we were talking five years ago and you were like, what do you think of NA beer? I'd be like, it's fucking disgusting. It'll never be good. And obviously I've got a lot more drinking. Luckily, not alcoholic to you. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it, to find out that I'm wrong, because I'm hearing from Jordan and so many other people whose palates I really respect, like, no, it's really good. I, I feel like we're five years away from great wine, and it seems like it's it's only- Great, natural. great NA wine. Yeah, yeah great yeah. NA wine, of course. Um, it seems like that is is truly going to happen, and it's going to happen in a big way. And I feel like, like with NA beer, you're going to get people who don't drink alcohol who are going to start actually writing about the NA category. And I feel you guys will probably be the first I look to. I'll look to Punch, Thank you. of course, but I'll look to you guys as well. And how do you think about your editorial calendar? I want to get back to the publication. Um, and how do you think about like the big stories in wine? I mean, this is such a challenging category. I used to be an editor at Punch for years, and wine was always one of the most difficult categories. I mean, Talia Baiocchi, founder, has a great palette and aesthetic and and really led that charge. But man, your job is hard. And I just want to like really reiterate that. Well, I mean, I'm not... Digging ditches for eight dollars an hour. I mean, there are jobs that are hard. Okay, like, you know, I'm, I'm typing and getting. Thank you to type for stuff. pointing um, out. Good, but tell me what you mean by why you think it's so challenging. Because it's a moving target, and I think you've got, um, as you said, it one can be infinite. I think that's a paraphrase. You said that there's just a lot of um, places to focus on, and we could fall into traps. And I think there's a lot of traps in wine writing where you're writing about, you know, aesthetics and trends and you're writing about natural wine. You're snarking on natural wine. You're using these like broad categories. I'm a fan of natural wine. No, of course you are. And, and I think it's a big part of like, like low intervention wines is part of your, your bag and that's cool. But I think like even the most skilled wine writers, I could say the same about coffee writers, I could say the same about cocktail writers. They fall into these traps and these tropes and it starts to feel repetitive and it starts to feel the same and to be fresh, but also speak to like a broad audience. It's not easy. That's what I mean by that. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, th that's a challenge, but that's a challenge, I think, with anything. If, if you have a publication that's about a particular, um, you know, enthusiasm or pastime, like. If this was a podcast about bicycling and I was running a magazine about bicycling, we'd say the same thing. If, if it was about sailing, we'd say the same thing. If it's about cooking, you could probably say the same thing. You know, you have to be mindful. Um, like I had friends who worked at food magazines and they would – every year they would dread the Thanksgiving issue because like you got to do it. And ultimately it's like it's a turkey, it's stuffing, it's kind of the same thing. All right, fine. That's one – Issue. This is back when it was just issues. You know, we're going to do, I'm sure we're going to do holiday wines. We're going to do seasonal wines. Um, but it changes. Like, you know, what was good last year is not necessarily good this year. Um, a new producer comes online. There is a new producer in a region that no one has really thought about who found a bunch of old vines who's doing great stuff at a great price. Um, I mean, in the past five years, um, I would have told you five years ago that Chile is not a super interesting wine region. There are winemakers that have found old vines that are doing really cool stuff in and around Itata. I was just talking with someone about that yesterday. Um, you know, for a long time, South African wine was really terrible. You know, producers found a bunch of old vines and they started making wines in a sensible way. Um, for a long time, Australian wine was fairly monodimensional. Producers found some old vines. They started making it an interesting way. So I'm repeating myself in terms of the story, but it's all, it's different people. It's different places. It's different terroirs. It's different wines. And, um, I don't know. It it feels fairly endless to me. I mean, you know, talk to me in three years. I know. And, and hopefully you will talk to me in three I years. I will. We will have you back. <laughs> no, this is really, really fun. It's great having you in. Let's go back to your time playing in bands. You went to 15 countries. You toured the world. You had a little money, I would imagine. What do you mean? <laughs> okay, maybe you had a tiny bit of money. What, Wait, no, I'm serious. I'm, I'm, I'm setting up the thing. question okay. to say... Were you drinking wines along the way while you were touring the world? Because like 15 countries is a lot to tour as a, in a band. And like, give me some like, are there any cool wine moments that you'd set up that you had had a little bit of a wine background with your father and opening great bottles and had a little appreciation and you're on the road? It seems natural that wines would enter the fray. So I did most of my touring between the years of like 1988 and 1995. And then again, for a concentrated period when my band Bitch Magnet got back together, um, we were asked to reunite for uh, by a festival in the UK called Altamar's Parties. And we did like a tour of, we went through Asia, we went through Europe, and we went through America. So really as a sort of wine interested person who could afford a bottle of wine, there was like, you know, that era of, um, of Bitch Magnet. And, um, I remember in Europe when we were out of – actually, this this only was true for the one show we did in Germany when I was like, by the way, like, 
there should be a local white and a local red. Like, make it smart. Like, just and <laughs> great. That was in Cologne. They treated us great. I did this. The, the show was twelve years ago. I don't remember the wine, but I will say this: um, when Bitch Magnet played our reunion show in San Francisco, um, I was friendly. I am friendly with the winemaker. Fred Scherer of the, he's got an eponymous winery. Um, I had met him when I was doing a story for Food and Wine and uh, we'd stayed in touch. And he arranged to send like something like a case of his Pinot to the rickshaw stop, um, which was great. And um, yeah, we went through a bunch of it that night. I flew to the next show with a bunch of it. So um, I thanked you in the book, Fred, but thank you again. Yeah, this is great to go on the record. And then the when guys are looking out for their uh, the artists in, in their lives. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I I mean, I'm I'm in a band now. We just recorded something, and um, you know, if we do tour, uh, it'll probably be Europe, and I'll be paying close attention. John, to this. what's the band? Let's get let's. Talk the about- band is called We Contain Multitudes, and um, I uh, love it. Great. We 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 have a record that'll be coming out uh, early next year on a label called Expert Work. Um, all this just happened. We just recorded it late last year, and we just cut the deal with the label. Um, we do not have any social media, and we do not have any footprint whatsoever <laughs> online, and that that's something that needs to happen. Are these so. former bandmates? Are these friends? Uh, it's the drummer from Bitch Magnet, who I've known since I was in my late teens, and um, who kind of ruined me for every other drummer. His name is Orestes Morphine, and he's one of the absolute greats. More people need to know about him. Many people do, but more people need to. Bassist Simon Kobayashi, who is from London, who we met when his band opened for Bitch Magnet. We just stayed in touch. Um, he's uh, he's the bassist. I'm the guitarist. He's a much better guitarist than I am. So cool. So you're you're setting up this 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 band. You you have a, a deal. You're 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 editor in chief of a wine magazine. Fuck, dude. How do you keep the, How do you keep it all straight? I don't. Um, I'm, it's exciting I, for I do you. Not man. I do not. No. It's it's uh, it's um, and I mean it. I it's it, it's awesome. Um, I'm not an organized person. And um, thank you to all the people who um, keep me in check on that. This goes for everybody at the New Wine Review, in particular, Sarah Parker Jang, who's effectively our managing editor, and um, Xander Barron, our CEO, and Brittany, our um, operations person, and Sarah Keen, who does art, and Jason Wilson, who's our star writer. I love that you shout out your, your guys because I feel like uh, we don't talk about our managing editors enough when we have them because I would, they, they save your we, life. We would not have a publication. with uh, Actually, without any of these people, we would not have a publication. It's a very small team. I'm glad you brought that up. It's a great segue. You know, as I mentioned, you covered media, uh, you know, you're a reporter, you covered the world that we kind of work in. And now you're on the other side, you're a, you're an editor in chief. But let me ask you, like, just in general, how does the new wine review stay in business? Like, how, what is your monetization plan? Like, I think it's a big question about, is it only subscriptions? Is it like partnership and subscriptions? How does, how does that all work? We, we are a subscriber-based publication. Um, we do not accept any advertising now at all. Um, we may accept advertising in the future, but it will not be from any entity in the beverage industry. Um, so, you know, it's much cleaner to do it this way. I had a great experience that, you know, the magazines that I was involved with, the Advertising Age, Business Week, Inc., where I was where I was running the editorial side, um, they were primarily advertiser supported, and um, that's just a different game. And you have to sort of do a dance where you're doing right by the reader, but you also have to do give the advertiser, um, you know, basically stuff to work with, stuff that they can like sponsor, and like that is complicated. And um, it can be really exhausting. And this is very clean. It's like, what does the reader want? Can we make that work? How um, do you acquire customers and, and and readers? Like, what's your what's your like model for customer acquisition? I mean, there's a, there's a complicated customer acquisition model, and I'm frankly not the best person to speak to that. That's kind of in Xander's and uh, okay. uh, Xander's and Brittany Martin. Like a so. good reporter, you're dodging the. No, question. no, I mean, like, I literally, like, I mean, I, I I've fucking... seen I've seen the spreadsheet. Like, I know like vaguely what the cost is supposed to be per subscriber, but like, oh. I couldn't give you. I wasn't asking that. No, that, it's totally that, fine. You're, you're being... But but I mean, it's it, it's it's so we've got um we've got a newsletter with 10,000 plus, you know, uh, names on it. We've, we, th- there are ways to, it is very difficult to break through on social media. There are ways to do that. Um, you know, we're bulking up our Instagram presence and we're, um, without going to great detail, we're exploring partnerships with a, with a variety of partners. Okay, that, that's cool. I think so it's a blend of sub and partnership. You're going to have sustained revenue from that. I mean, the, the partnerships are there to drive subscriptions, Sorry, basically. Right, yeah. correct. 
thank you for correcting that. So you're not taking partner dollar, but you're using partners to grow subs and bring in new audience and all that. Tough game. Like, you know, media has changed a lot. And like right now it's for food media, which, you know, of course, wine is lumped into this general category. We've we've suffered a lot of, of crazy, uh, I would say injustices in some ways, you know, the way meta has kind of, uh, you know, changed the game uh, many yeah. times over. I think retail advertising is quite, quite quite scary for anyone doing consumer ever uh, consumer publications i think that's scary I've, I've talked about that a lot but i don't know how do you how do you l- look at food media's future um well number one i'm very grateful that i'm not working for an advertiser supported um publication i mean I, I don't mean that in a snarkier mean way it's like it's hard and um advertisers want something for their money which is totally reasonable when there when there gets to be an imbalance between what they want and what is done right by the readers, it gets uncomfortable. Uh, what you have identified about the platforms like Meta is significant and enormous. And um, it, you know, the game has gotten a lot harder, but media was never super easy and most things worth doing are not super easy. And, you know, I, I covered media and I was talking to these, um, you know, publishers, men and women who had been around in the 80s. And they're like, you wouldn't believe how easy it was. Like there was a memo that went around that told us how to sneak Coke into the Dominican Republic. <laughs> Someone told me that um, for, for the offsite. Um, like it just sounded crazy. And at, in the year 2002, I was like, that's not this world anymore. Like it's and this this was before, you know, Google and Meta were the giant platforms that they are. But like, you know, people were moving to experiences online. That has enormous implications if your business model is selling an expensive back cover to some advertiser. And I say that with some sadness because I love print media. I love magazines. We we just got Bon Appetit at our house and like my wife and I were fighting over it as we always do. The new editor is spectacular. I'm very excited about it again. Exciting things happening there, yeah. Very excited about it again. But, you know, she has to work with a much smaller staff and a much smaller budget than she used to. I mean, like, can you still do a really good magazine like that? Sure. I mean, is it harder? Yeah. Well said. I I, I think we can we can put it there, uh, put a pin in there. I think it's it's a great uh, last thought about being excited about media because it's clear that the new wine review is an exciting place. And I just want to close and ask you, you know, when you're drinking a wine and maybe you've read about it on Punch or the new wine review or Bon Appetit or somewhere else, how are we as wine drinkers going to remember that wine? It's always the hardest thing. You mean how do they remember something you write about or how do they how do you remember the experience of the wine? The experience of the wine. How do we place that away and then move on to the next bottle? Cuz I think that's a big part of this world is 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 remembering the wine and maybe going back to it a second time. You know, it really depends on how serious you are about it. I take photos of every wine label that I drink. Um, I have a spreadsheet where I keep track of, um, I'm insane, I'll just say that. But I mean, I have a spreadsheet where I keep track of what I drink and I make little notes on it. um, Because number one, I want to remember, I was doing this before I had this job, but I kind of need to remember too. Um, Photographs help. um, But, you know, honestly, it's, it's about experiences. And it's about being in places with people that you love or, I mean, having a great experience by yourself, you know, you know, at a wine bar, like, you know, reading a book and just gradually working your way through a magical bottle of, you know, Beaujolais or Burgundy or, you know, a great Blau Frankish from Austria. I mean, it, it can be anything. And, you know, I think there's a lot of people who are new to wine when they go to a winery and they get excited because they meet the winemaker and then they bring the wine home, it's not quite as good. Like there, there is something there is something about setting. I mean, like in time you learn to work that into your assessment. But I mean, it's like, you know, you remember a certain amount of standout experiences and the way that you remember more of them is, you know, you do the things you do with anything. Like you write, you write stuff down, you take pictures of it. I love that sentiment. I think I'm, I'm still hanging on to like, uh, uh, a, a wine from the Vino Verde region from Afros Winery. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I, I have this memory of this wine. I don't drink anymore, but I have this memory. And it's about the experience of trying it for the first time and then trying it again and again. So I mean, my, my dad poured me a glass of wine in 1996 or 97 or 98. And like, I remember how it felt. I remember how it tasted. And I remember saying like, okay, like now I get it. 
there, there, there's something here. It's cool. That's why we like wine. That's that, that's why wine is 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 placed highly. I think when you t- talk about foods, it's like placed really highly in that hierarchy, right? Yeah. I'm, it's very high for me for sure. <laughs> John, and this is Taste. We have guests about the discerning taste. So to close this interview, here's a little rapid fire, fast and furious taste check. I know you've not reviewed these questions. I've not reviewed these questions. This is straight up the dome. The best fruit. Papaya or peach. The worst vegetable. Any squash. <laughs> I will go to the mat on this. All mat. squash. Any, any squash or eggplant. No, no, I'm sorry. Damn. No, squash. Because you, 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 you can make eggplant parmesan. You can't Night really go to the squash. Taking, taking strays. All right. The best dessert. Peach pie. Your favorite American fast food chain. Uh, I'll say what everybody says. Popeyes. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Biscuit. You like the biscuits? Not really. Okay. <laughs> I have a high bar for biscuits. <laughs> yeah, high bar for biscuits. Okay. Your favorite cookbook of all time. Oh, my God. God, dude. Um, I know. This is why I give you these questions. All right. So number one, I'll, I'll, I got to give the important caveat. I've been very happily married for almost 20 years. My wife cooks. She's much better than I, I am. Um, so I'm going to say Joy of Cooking because yeah. it taught me an enormous amount and it's still really great. A favorite recent cookbook discovery? Uh, anything by Adelangi. Yeah. Um, that, that's not... that's. That, that, that's not a great answer either. Um, the, <laughs> the, 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 the Joe Beef one is really fun, but it's like, it's like- They're you, both great answers. Those I mean, but, but, but you don't, you don't, like, I mean, you don't cook like Joe Beef at home. No, like, like, they're you, cool you, books, you, you die, basically, you know? They're, they're good cookbooks. And though. nothing but respect for Joe Beef. No, definitely. Okay. Your favorite wine bar in America? Well, I got to say Four Horsemen, but okay. so let me, let me give you another one. Um, I probably would have said terroir, but it doesn't exist anymore. No, it doesn't exist So anymore. favorite wine bar, it doesn't have to be in America. It has to be in America. You're killing My it. My next question is not America, just to give you a preview. Okay, that's preview. A, that, 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 So we're, we're starting with America. We're starting with America. I'm mentally thinking, um, oh God, I'm so, I'm really shitting the bet on this one. Um, <laughs> I will say, <laughs> I will this say. This is why you, this is why I, I email you the questions. Uh, the, the, uh, this is why I didn't want to look at it because I, I didn't want to think about it too hard. I'll say uh, I'll say Plastic Fats for second place. Okay, I mean favorite. I already said it. You've that, already that's said all it. I can think fun. of yeah. All right, your favorite wine bar not in America. Uh, coin flip between Noble Rotten London and Verville in um, Paris. I'm sure th- both those get a lot of um, uh, both of them get a lot of play. I'm sure. For but, a reason. Yeah, for I mean it, it's it's hard to get away from them. A couple more a cuisine you would like to learn more about. Korean. Yeah, um, I've I. When Bitch Magnet reunited, we toured through Korea, and I discovered that, um, as with Turkey when I went there, um, there's just an entire universe of that cuisine that does not make it to America. Um, and um, I like it. Th- that was ten years ago. Like some more of it's here, but it's it is fascinating. There is always kimchi. There is always gochujang in our refrigerator. Um, always, always, always. Love to hear that. Last one. Your favorite sandwich? Like type or specific? Both. So specific right now is the Ali from uh, Quartz Creek Grocers, um, which is turkey, provolone, and broccoli rabe with hot honey and mayo, both of which I get on the side. Um, although uh, historically, um, the Italian from Maine, which is yeah. somewhat difficult to explain, um, but it's great. Category... Oh, that's really hard because now I'm going to get into po boys and bon me. I, I should leave it at that. Leave it at that. Yeah. I love this. Shout out to Italians in Portland, Maine. Thank I you. love it. John Fine, this has been a real pleasure. Thanks so I've much. I've enjoyed the absolute hell out of this. Thank you so much for having me. This is Taste is hosted by Eliza Abarbanel and me, Matt Rodbar. The show is produced by Shalia Harris and Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. Theme music by Steve Rydell. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com. And make sure to subscribe to our newsletter for updates on all cool things that are happening. 